We are in week number two of our Pray First series. Again, Pray First series based off of this book, Pray First, by uh, best-selling author and pastor Chris Hodges. And I know some of you have already gotten this book and you've just ingested this book and uh, are receiving from it. Uh, but our hope is, through this series, is that your prayer life is impacted. How you spend your time with God is impacted in a powerful way, and we're building this series in a way where it affects it, where you're able to yield through it powerful and supernatural results that you couldn't get arriving into your life any other way. And so I'm telling you, this series is designed to impact your prayer life, to be a prayer life that yields results uh, in, in ways. And so we talked about uh, last week, putting God first is required to do that, right? In a message we preach called, In the Beginning, God, right? Prayer needs to be a priority in your life. How you begin your day matters, right? Let God be at the starting block or, 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 or the start of a reaction. Let him be the focus uh, of, 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 of the first focus that you come to when a, when a thought's in your mind or how you approach a relationship. Make sure that God's leadership is there and his voice is guiding you. And we also talked about having a place of prayer is important and, and putting a plan to your prayer time with God is important. Uh, our series verse that we're launching this all from is Ephesians chapter six and verse 18 where Paul says, pray in the spirit in every situation Use every kind of prayer and request there is. And we're gonna spend the rest of this series looking at the kinds of prayers and, and templates of prayers that are found in Scripture, available for you to use and install into your prayer times. And so let's dig right into these prayer templates. It's gonna be a good one. And today, I wanna call this first one the prayer of Moses. The prayer of Moses, this message could also be titled Tabernacle Prayers. And so with that, I encourage you to turn, if you got your Bibles, to Exodus chapter 25. Uh, if not, we got all, if you don't have your Bible here with you, you want to turn it on to us, the, the, the message notes and the JC app, we got them for you on the screen. We got you an opportunity where you're soaked in the scripture we're going to dig into. But in Exodus chapter 25, before we read, I kind of want to set up. Uh, some understanding to this chapter in general. So after Moses and the people of Israel were set free from being slaves in Egypt, they began their journey to the promised land. And, you know, it's a journey that should have taken them days, but it ended up taking them 40 years, um, wandering around in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula before they eventually got there. But that made them people on the move. Obviously, always and ever. They were always on the move. They were, uh, and because they were people on the move, they needed a church on the move. And, and so they needed a portable building that would still allow their worship of God and their commitments to worship God to remain uh, faithful. And so when God, who would show up as a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day leading them, you, you know the story, when the cloud or, or, or when the fire pillar would stop, the people would stop, and then they would set up church. And it was a portable way of doing life. Uh, for those of you who were part of Journey Church when we first started, I mean, we were a portable church. Like, we couldn't just leave our stuff up. We had to tear it down after every single service and at Bombfuls Auditorium and then set it back up. Uh, this is what they did. Everywhere they went, they would tear down and set up. And, and so when, when God would do that, when he would stop, they, they would set it up. They would set up church, or, or as they called it, the tabernacle. And that's seen here in Exodus 25, where God said in verse eight, he said, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary. And I want us to notice the why here, so that I can live among them. I mean, no, that's just ever and always God's heart. It's just to be with you. I just, I just wanna be with you. Uh, he said, you must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. And, and I wanna kinda, this is just a, a rendering uh, of, of the tabernacle. 
uh, that somebody made. I was like trying to find out like what's the coolest rendering. Actually, the coolest kind of video, render, I'm not gonna show it, but it was a Minecraft video. <laughs> somebody rebuilt the tabernacle in Minecraft, and I'm like, man, this is incredible. But uh, I was like, I'm not gonna show a Minecraft video up in the sermon. But uh, like, it's, a, it's really cool what some people can do, but this is a rendering here. And actually, if, if you got the cards in your seats, uh, I, I left this for you in, in the seats as well. This is kind of what you would, this is the view you would have like from the top if there was no top to it. You could kind of see where the pieces of furniture were. And uh, I kind of left it outlined for those of you who got kids or grandkids. Maybe you just want to go and regurgitate this message to them in, in a way that's relative to them and give them some crayons or something and let them just color around each part uh, just to kind of help make it memorable. But I just wanted you to be able to take this with you. Uh, so you can kind of retain this information because I'm telling you, this is gonna be so key uh, for your prayer life if you would embrace this teaching for your life. Uh, but this right here kind of gives you some semblance of what the tabernacle of Moses looked like. And as you can see here, this right here is the outer court, and I know it's tough to see perhaps even in the front, but there are two pieces of furniture, and, and you can see that here in the outer court. There are two pieces of furniture that you would see uh, here in the outer court. Uh, which was referred to there, you know, obviously. And this, this tent here, this, this large structure was divided into two parts. The, 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 the part that you would walk in was uh, originally, the whole thing was called the tent of meeting. It was called the inner court or the holy place. Uh, but again, it was, it was divided by the back part here by this huge curtain, uh, or they called it a veil, where the holy of holies was. And that was where the Ark of the Covenant was. That was where the presence of God dwelt. So you would have here, you'd walk into the holy place, the inner court, there was, a, there was a veil there, and you see that, you'd walk into the holy of holies where the presence of God dwelt. But to get to this part here, the holy of holies, you just couldn't roll up in there. You just couldn't walk into the holy of, of holies. You couldn't stroll in where the Ark of the Covenant was. There was a process to get there. There was... Uh, a process that involved all these other areas, these pieces of furniture that you had to go to first before you went into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God dwelt. And I know this isn't something that we do today. We don't, we don't have to do this anymore today because of Jesus in Matthew 27. It says while he was on the cross, it says that he cried out in a loud voice and he gave up his spirit. At the moment, Jesus is physical body expired on the cross, look at this, the curtain of the temple that divided the inner court and the Holy of Holies, look at this, was torn in two. Now this is, of course, Solomon's temple where this is happening, which is a pre-version of that in Moses, Moses' day. But it was torn in two. What does that mean when that happened in Matthew 27? It means that we no longer need a high priest that you no longer need a high priest to go into the Holy of Holies to represent you in the presence of God. You see, the people couldn't just go in there, let alone Moses just strolling in. The people couldn't just go in there. It had to be a high priest that represented you that went into the Holy of Holies. And so when that moment happened in Matthew 27, when Jesus' physical body expired on the cross, God was saying, Everyone now has direct access into the presence of God. And again, that's all because of Jesus, the son of the living God, the lamb of God. Come on, our high priest giving his life for us so that we can experience his presence forever. And so thankfully, though, we don't need to do all of this by the book, right, uh, anymore. We don't. We don't need to make our lobby the outer court. You know, we don't have to have the, all, all, that, all that stuff. You can just, you, we can just, we don't gotta, <laughs> you got free access to the Father now, no matter where you are. Somebody say a good amen if you're thankful for that. But, but hear me, just because we no longer need to do all this, that doesn't erase the principle of what it all served to be. There are still very powerful principles behind these patterns, and, and, and if you will look at what these pieces of furniture 
and the process represented, which is what we're gonna do here in the rest of this message, they most certainly connect with how we should be connecting with the God of the universe today. For instance, it says in Exodus 33 and verse 11, it says, inside the tent of meeting, right, after Moses followed the protocol of the process, after he went into the inner court, once he goes into the Holy of Holies, it said, look at this, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Can I just say, when you really work your way toward God, like when you really work your way toward him, that's how he wants to connect with you. That right there. Come on, I, I pray your heart is being anchored right now to the words on this screen. Because that's his heart for you in prayer. That's, that's, that's my heart for you as your pastor, is, is for you to get to a place in prayer where you are face to face with God. And he is speaking to you, and you are hearing him speak to you as one speaks to a friend. I'm telling you, if you get there, come on, somebody, you'll never have to have your pastor tell you to pray again. If you get there, you become addicted to the presence of God. You become anchored to the presence of God being experienced just like this. So let's look at the protocol here that Moses took to get there. It's, as you can see, it's six pieces of furniture inside of seven steps. Are you ready? Number one, to get to the presence of God, right? In order to get there, Moses first had to go into the outer court. He had to go to the outer court where Moses or the high priest was found giving, come on, let's all say these bottom three words together, giving God thanks. And you see this as a scriptural theme of entrance into the presence of God, attached to anyone who was journeying to the presence of God. Before they got to even the first piece of furniture in the outer court, they would enter the gates of the outer court. And that, 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 that moment that they entered the gates was a moment of thanksgiving. It was a moment of praise. How many of you are starting to hear something you've heard in the Bible before, right? Enter his gates with thanksgiving, right? Enter his courts with praise. This, this was culture. It was custom. It was pattern. That's Psalm 100 and verse 4, right? David said, enter his gates with thanksgiving. This was mimicked in the life of Moses here. Into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Come on, this should be how we start prayer. Long before you ever ask him to do something new for you, long before you ever bring a prayer request before him, how about thank him for something that he's already done? Thank him for just who he is. I think one of the errors of our prayer life is we just jump in with our request of what we want him to do, and we gotta be careful, friends. Because I like how Chris Hodges said in his book, we gotta be careful treating God like some celestial Santa Claus or a vending machine that we just pop in what we want, get what we want, and walk away, friends. Let's, let's approach him with hearts that are just thankful for the fact that he made a way for us just to be with him. Somebody say good amen if you're tracking with me right now. In fact, let's do it right now. Let's enter his gates. Let's enter his courts. Come on, let's just have a time of thanksgiving right now. Come on, let's give him some praise in this room right now. Let's thank him for who he is. Thank him for the blood. Thank him for his son. Thank him that he made a way for us right now just to have direct access into his life. Would you just tell him thank you right now? Even if your heart just whispers it, thank you, God, for who you are. That's how we should start prayer every time we dig in. God, thank you for just loving me like you do. This is, this is how I strive to start prayer. How I, this is how I strive to start every morning. Somebody bought me a, a, an, a, an Amazon Alexa show or something, and it talks to you. And I, I, I walk in my living room and I go, 
Alexa, play some praise and worship. And all of a sudden, like, thank God, or, or, or firm foundations will come on and just start to fill the atmosphere of, of, of the room. Why? Because that's what I want at the start of my day. Every single time I walk in, that's the first thing I, that comes out of my mouth in the morning coming down the hallway. Alexa, play some praise and worship. Because I want to enter into my day, come on, with praise and thanksgiving. What does that do, friends? When, when you allow praise to be at the start of your day or, or, or the start of your time with God, it will prepare you for the journey of, uh, of who it is that you're connecting with. When I, when I hear a song like Firm Foundation start my morning, if I'm going through darkness, come on, how I many know Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, you will have dark times. I'm telling you, when I'm, when I'm waking up in the middle of a dark time, when I'm, just the simple act of praise and thanksgiving reminds me, not how dark my situation is. I already know how dark my situation is. The simple act of prayer and, and, and worship, I, I love it. It doesn't dilute reality. It doesn't tell you that your problems no longer exist. But what it does is it tells me how big my God is and how bright the light of the world actually is in this dark time. And I get to hold hands in this dark time with the light of the world, friends. So it's important to have an outer court moment in your time with God, amen? Now, number two, Moses would then approach what they called the brazen altar. And, and, and on this, and you see that here on your card, like this altar on it would have been dead animals. Uh, this was a place of blood. This was a place of burning. As you see here on your card, there's four horns that, that are on the corners of those altars. Those would be covered when Moses would approach it, dripping with blood. And the sound and smell of fire would be consuming the flesh of those animals being sacrificed in the name of your sin. You see, this act, when Moses would approach it, this visual would remind you that something had to die because you sinned. There's a cost to your sin. That because of your sins, blood had to be shed and of course, it was the blood of the innocent. These animals didn't do anything. It's the blood of the innocent shed for the sins of the guilty. And of course, we don't have to do that anymore because the cross of Jesus was once and final, right? The Lamb of God sacrificed for your sin and mine. And that's why it's important. Here's, here's, here's the application. When, when you come to prayer, like after you thank him, take a moment and just think on the cross. Have a brazen altar moment and just think on the cross of Jesus. Picture the cross. Focus your thoughts on the cross of Jesus. Let that be the second thing that you do. Honestly, without this, without the cross, we don't have what we have in God's presence waiting for you. The cross made away, friends. In fact, let's take a moment and just think on the cross right now. Come on, in your own way. In your own focus, just think about the cross of Jesus right now and how it blesses and affects your life. Come on, God, thank you for what's available to me. Thank you that what's available to me is not because of anything I have done, but because of what Jesus, your son, has done. We used to sing an old song in church it would go, oh, the blood of Jesus. Come on, you gotta ignore my horrible voice, but sometimes it sounds better when you sing along with me, amen. Sing, oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Come on, what does it do? It washes white as snow. They used to they even take another verse. I'm thankful for the blood. Of Come on. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. 
Psalm 100 in, in, in verse two says, let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sin and he heals all my diseases. That's why I'm thankful for the blood. He heals, look, he forgives how much of your sin? Friends, remember that laundry detergent? A-L-L, right? All of your sins. He's paid for what you do. God, thank you for the cross. He heals all my diseases. Come on, and that doesn't just have to mean physical ailment because disease means dis-ease. You, you see the, the, the two words there. He wants to heal and take away the plague of emotional and, and mental and, 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 and even spiritual dis-ease. He wants to help you with your worry and, and your stress and your anxiety and your depression. Friends, this is what connecting to the cross in this way provides for you. So Moses would have this moment at the brazen altar. And that number three, after Moses would go to the brazen altar, he would go to something called the laver. And you see that right here. And, and what's interesting about the laver was, was it was made out of mirrors. And uh, so, so, so when you looked into it, before you would wash, because you had to wash before you went in, before you did that, you looked into it and you saw yourself. Watch me through the water. And Paul even took this and connected this understanding to us today when he said in Ephesians chapter five and verse 26, so that he might sanctify the church, come on, make us closer to God, having cleansed her, that's you and I, by the washing of water with the word. That's the purpose of the labor. Washing of water with the word of God. You see, to Moses in this moment, that reflection that he was looking into as he looked into the labor bowl served to be a reminder to offer every part of himself to God to ensure that his life was lining up with the commands of the word that God so carefully gave him. And today, I believe that same pattern and principle needs to be experienced in your life and mine when we're approaching prayer, that every single one of us need to have a mirror moment, right, where we look into the mirror of God's word and we view ourself in the reflection of the water of God's word. And we ask ourselves, where am I not? Come on, where? Come on, just, I, I, I watch my wife in the mirror, and she watches me. You're doing this. Making sure the nose hairs aren't flying out too much, right? Just, what are we doing? We're, 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 we're trying to identify blemish. And that's what we need to be doing spiritually more than we do it naturally. I'm not saying don't do it nat naturally, but I'm just saying we need to have a moment where we're identifying the blemishes. Man, God, my attitude has not been lining up with your word at all. You're allowing yourself to see yourself through the word of God. How many are tracking with me right now? Uh, God, where am I failing? Come on, God, where are the blemishes? Help me in the sinful parts of my life. God, take this part of me that is doing nothing but paralyzing my, my spiritual progress. Would you take it? Hodges, in, in, in his book, Pray First Right, actually, he kind of goes through it. He has a top of his head to the soles of his uh, uh, feet process. He starts at the head. And so he'll be like, God, where in my mind am I not honoring your word? Then he, where, where in my thoughts, what thoughts have I allowed to stay a little too long? And, and they've worn out their welcome in your presence. Come on, how many know we all have those? You know, you have the power to arrest thoughts. Literally put them in cuffs and evict them out of your life. This is what that is, right? Philippians chapter four and verse eight, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So God, what, what in my life am I not, right? And then, and then after that, he goes to his ears, right? John chapter 10 and verse five, Jesus said, they won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know his voice. And look at this. 
My sheep, Jesus said, listen, 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 right, to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And so, God, am I, am I listening to the right voices? God, what voices am I listening to that's hurting my life and harming my life? Come on, how many know those voices don't always have to be just somebody else? How many know sometimes it's the voice that you create that's hurting you? So God, I wanna make sure my ears are lining up with your word and, 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 and then he'll go to his eyes. God, may I look where I need to look and may I not look where I don't need to be looking. And then he goes to his mouth, Lord, Lord, let, let my words be life-giving and not life-taking. May my words be used today to build others up and not tear others down. May I give compliments about people behind their back instead of gossip. Come on, no curses out of my mouth, God, only blessing. Proverbs 4, verse 24, avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. And it's important to have that moment. And then he goes down to his heart, to, to his hands. God, may I want my hands to be hands of generosity. Come on, what, what is he doing? He's, he's allowing himself to, to look as a whole into the labor, right? I, wanna, I want my life to be washed through your word. I want my hands to be hands of generosity, hands of care, hands of compassion, hands that give more than hands that take. Come on, hands that will be used to perhaps give my spouse a massage tonight instead of using that hand to point a finger at them. And, and then I'll go to his knees. God, may I bend these knees ever and always to you and you alone. May my life not serve other idols. And, and then I'll even go to his feet. Psalm 37, verse 23, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. God, show me and take my feet down the right paths today and not the wrong paths today. Proverbs 4, verse 26, mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. So God, change me. Make the image of my life sync with the image of you, O oh God, which, by the way, I believe I was created in your image. So let me live that out in every part of my life that you made. Come on, how many are seeing the blessing and impact behind the principle and the process of these tabernacle prayers established by Moses? But certainly they should be mimicked and templated, right? Ephesians 6, 8, use every kind of prayer and request there is. And, and, and the first one you, right here, this is a good one, good place to start. Number four, after the labor, now Moses would walk into this tent. And the first part, uh, the holy place, right, the tent of meeting, there were three pieces of furniture, as you see here. There were three pieces of furniture in there. And the first one that you would see would be the candlestick. The Hebrews call it the Jewish menorah. Uh, and the flames on this candle would, would never die out. They, they would always be fueled. They were to always be burning. Um, they were always fed and fueled to burn. In the Old Testament and New, the candlestick and these flames always served to represent the Holy Spirit and his work in your life. And that's an important focus to have in prayer. That's an important fuel to keep full in your life. Holy Spirit, I invite you as I look, come on, this is what Moses was doing, as I look at these ever and always burning candle flames, these flames never stop burning. These flames are always kept fuel. Oh God, may your spirit in the same way always be burning and, and working in my life and empowering my life and filling my life with the only power by which I can even live for you. Come on, I mean, the only way you can even live for Jesus is through the power of the Holy Spirit that allows you to do that. So we receive so much with the Holy Spirit. So much is available to you through the Holy Spirit. In fact, most theologians believe the seven prongs of that candle represent what Isaiah said in Isaiah uh, chapter 11 and verse two where it says, uh, it says the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Watch this, uh, the spirit of wisdom. There's, there's one of the candles, right? The, the, and understanding, Spirit of counsel, might, 
knowledge, right? Fear of the Lord. Every day, we should seek God in that way. Open that verse up and say, Holy Spirit of God, I need your wisdom today. Well, how many need God's wisdom and not your wisdom, right? Especially in situations where you're just like, I don't know what to do. God, I need your wisdom in this moment. I don't know where to go from you. Or, or, or God, I need your might right now. Holy Spirit, give me your might because I'm struggling to have strength to do what's right right now. Holy Spirit, help me to fear only God. But I wouldn't fear things like man's opinion or people's opinion on my life. Well, see the patterns that Moses laid out here. This is what's available to you every time you pray. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul said, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Paul's talking to Timothy here. Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And he's telling, listen, you gotta fan into flame the gift of God which, which was placed in you through the laying on of my hands. And watch this, verse seven. For the spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Look at what he gives us, friends. You know, that's, I, that's what I believe happens when, when, when we come together in church. This is why I was pretty passionate just to meet today. Because I just believe when we connect, this happens every single Sunday. Because I think some of us come in here with an ember, you know, just burning. You come in here with, it's not, the, it's not a wildfire, but you just, you've been going through some things, so you got like an ember burning, a passion and, and, and desire to do God's will and work. But when you come in here, it's like, what starts happening? Like you, the church just starts fanning and, and blowing onto that ember. And, and what happens when embers catch wind? Embers catch wind, that they, they become a flame. And, 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 and the more wind, the bigger the flame. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And this is why I encourage you just to ever and always just be around people and of faith and an atmosphere of faith that, that, that serves the wind to you. In Acts 2, in a gathering, what happened? A wind manifested and flames appeared on the heads of each person gathered. What happened? After that, those flames set the world ablaze for Jesus in their lifetime. Come on, somebody say good amen if you're tracking with me. The candlestick, you just had a moment with the Holy Spirit. Number, number five, on the other side of the room was this table. It was, it, it was, it was called the, the table of showbread. And on it was, was 12 freshly baked loaves of bread. Have you ever smelled bread fresh out the oven before? Mm, my God, it smells so good, it'll make you wanna smack your mama's cat right in the face. That's how good it smells. It's not like you want to do that naturally, but that's what it happens when you smell good bread. Like, but, but, but that smell, is, it's, it's used to pull you in. It's used to lure you into an understanding, let me get spiritual here, that the only thing that can feed your soul is God's word. The table of showbread represented our need to feed on God's word and use it not just as the source of strength for our soul, but use it as a weapon against our enemy. Just like Jesus when he was tempted, right, by the enemy, the temptation of Christ, right? When you dig into that, the enemy was tempting him and, and, and what did Jesus say when the enemy was trying to tempt him to, to, to eat food while he was on a 40-day fast? Matthew chapter four and verse four, Jesus answered, he's telling the devil this statement, it is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. What was he saying? When he was tempted, he fought back with scripture. You see, when you quote scripture to the devil, in moments of struggle and temptation, watch me, you win every time. You win every single time. This is why Paul said in Ephesians 6, when he was talking about victory over the devil in times of warfare, he said in Ephesians 6, he said to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Do you know, 
in that whole list that Paul gives of arm, the armor of God, there's only one part of it that's an offensive weapon. Everything else is just armor, it's defensive. The only part is offensive is this right here. In other words, this is the only way God wants you attacking the enemy. That's it. Is, is by allowing the word of God to come out of your mouth. Meaning he wants you to take this and let it come out of your mouth so you can do some damage to the enemy who's been trying to do some damage to you. Number six, finally in, in, in the holy place before you went into the presence of God, there, there was uh, the altar of incense. And it would burn incense. Much, and much like the candlestick, it always burned. They never let it stop burning. And the smell of it was something that would uh, uh, soothe your soul, uh, as incense can do. And, and the moment your senses received it, it would just bless you. But, but let me give you the intended scriptural perspective here on this. Incense, biblically, was something that we give God. And our lives are supposed to be a burning incense. That's what your life is supposed to be, a burning incense to God. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15. He says, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance. You might have a translation that says incense, rising up to God. It's your life. What does that look like, friends? That's worship. That's what that is. It's worship. This right here is worship. Simple as that. You know what worship allows you the opportunity to do? It, it allows you the opportunity to have a, a, an understanding or, or to embrace the spectrum of the names of God. Names are important. Danny. That's an important name. To you, he may be Danny. Yeah, that's Danny. But you may not know Danny like I know Danny. Because to me, he's not just Danny. To me, he's a trusted cohort. To me, he's a true friend. To me, he's a traveling partner. Like he feels called to travel with me. I'm getting ready to go do a revival in Jamaica here in a couple of weeks and he feels called to travel with me. He's, a, he's, a, he's an intercessor in my life. He's always available when I need him, whether it's ministry or personal. And in the same way, I'm not gonna make this about Danny, but God has many names, right? He's not just God. I mean, no, like, he's your comforter. He's your friend. He's my defender. He's my provider. He's my, right? You insert, and, and, and when you worship, right, in those lights, what, what does that do? Like it offers incense from your heart to heaven. God, I just worship you because you are my defender. What does that do? That attracts, that, 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 that smells going up to the throne room of God. And that attracts God's blessing to you and to your life, friends. Proverbs 18.10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous, watch this, who are smart because it says when things are going wrong, what do they do? They run to it. The people who are not smart when things are going wrong, they run away from it. But the people who are smart run to it and are safe. And so, before you have ever uttered a God give me or God give me this or give me that in prayer, how many can see the power to the pattern that Moses is templating here? That would, if, if you did this, it would probably impact your prayer life and your life in greater ways than it's perhaps being impacted right now. Amen? And this is what, this is what Paul meant in Ephesians 6, right, our series verse when he said, use every kind of prayer and request that there is. Take Moses' prayer, 
for instance, and use it, and you'll get what Moses got in the presence of God. Because after he did all that, each of these pieces of furniture, he, watch this, walked in to the Holy of Holies. And what did he find there? It was there where he found the Ark of the Covenant. And it was there where God was face to face, speaking to him as one speaks to a friend. But it was also in this holy place where Moses would intercede for others. He would cry out to God for his forgiveness and to wash over the people of Israel. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul said, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, somebody say prayers, mm, intercession, somebody say intercession, and thanksgiving be made for who? All people, for kings, all those in authority, come on, not just the ones you, you like, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases, come on, like incense, God, our Savior, who what? Wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Would you stand with me? This is what prayer should involve. Well, I'm telling you, this is a great template to follow. There is so much power to this pattern. I, I want you to be encouraged, Journey Church, to use this card to help remind you to take these steps toward God in your time with God in prayer. In other words, when you pray, make sure that you, I think we got all these points here, take time to thank him. Right? Take time to think on the cross. Take time to align your life up with his word. Take time to keep the flame of the Holy Spirit of God burning bright in your life through a continued invitation for him to lead you. Take time to feed on God's word. This is where like Lectio Divina would be great. We talked about it in the Streak series last fall. That would, that would be a great, great place for that to be. And use it also God's word is a weapon to overcome the enemy who's attacking your life and attacking your family and attacking your home. Take time to worship and allow the incense of your heart to express your love for him through the many names that he has shown himself to be faithful through in your life. And lastly, take time to make intercession for others. God, who around my life doesn't know you yet like this? God, who around my life is going through something right now that they just need you? Let your prayer time envelop these focuses. And I'm telling you, friends, you will arrive at a life that habitually finds itself speaking with God face to face like one speaks to a friend. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for just how beautiful your word is. writer of Proverbs said that your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. I thank you for the path that your word shows us to take. Father, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, God, that you would allow a determination surrounded by discipline to be burning bright in our hearts, that we would be intentional in the time that we spend with you. God, as we can see on this, in this message, it's, it's not easy to just do this in two or three minutes. We need to put prayer as a priority in our life, carve out greater spaces and places of time to spend time with you. And it's there, God, where we find the source of our transformation. 
So Father, I thank you that the transformation that's waiting on the other end of all these efforts is going to be experienced, God, because of the determination that you are building in our hearts, God. Let us not just be people of the outer court. Let us not just be people, God, that stop at the brazen altar. Let us not just stop at the labor, God. Let us see where this all leads. It takes us to you, I pray. God, may our worship be that, I pray. And carry that heart, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah.